is my audio good? Yep. Great. Um, thank you, Bjorn, for the introduction. Um, and uh, so, good morning, everyone. This is very exciting. I haven't spoken in such a in front of such a large group of people for a very long time. I haven't been outside Australia for about three years, so this is really wonderful being here. Um, and I just want to thank uh, the organisers, so I can see Bjorn and Jen and whoever else is here this early, um, for, um, for getting this, this whole show off the ground. I, I think I was first invited about three years ago. Um, and I'm glad that it actually has actually happened. I've been enjoying the hiking and hanging out with, with people and seeing old friends and, and so on. Um, okay, um, first thing I want to mention is my course notes are online. Um, and there is a, a stream on the Zulip system. GSS Harvey. So there's a link to the notes there, and I think uh, I think Dana put them up on some PCMI IAS website. So I'm going to be doing Blackboard talks, but they're they're going to be following along those lecture notes. Okay, so I'm going to be sort of giving a bit of an overview of what's in those lecture notes. But if if I leave things out, it's because they're in the notes. Okay, so you should probably have them in front of you. That's a really useful thing to do for these lectures. Um, and you can use this Zulip stream for asking questions, discussions, and so on. I'll, I'll check it out a few times a day and, and see what's going on and answer questions. Um, okay, so what is this course about? So um, I wrote a paper um, in, I think, 2015 called Computing uh, Zeta Functions of Arithmetic Schemes. Um, now, I barely know what an arithmetic scheme is. It doesn't really matter. Um, what this paper was really about was uh, computing zeta functions of varieties of finite fields. So in other words, counting the number of solutions to systems of polynomial equations over finite fields. And what I did in this paper was that there are several sorts of sort of styles of complexity bounds that people have proved over the years for these sorts of problems. So there's, there's algorithms that run in square root of p time and algorithms that run in average polynomial time, all these sorts of things. And what I did in this paper was prove results that um, prove that you can, you can get these complexity bounds for any variety at all, completely general. Okay, you just write your varieties intersection of hypersurfaces and then you handle the hypersurfaces and, and you go from there. Um, so that was, that was one nice thing about that paper. And the other nice thing about it is that um, it didn't really rely on any fancy cohomology theories. It was all very elementary, right? You just need Fermat's little theorem and a little bit of number theory and it, it all happens. Um, so what I want to do in this course is sort of specialize the philosophy of that paper, the way I was thinking about this point counting problem, to the case of hyperelliptic curves. Okay, so what we're going to do is only think about hyperelliptic curves, so that gets rid of a lot of the complication from the generality of that paper, but it still gets across a lot of the main ideas. Um, and I'm also going to specialize, just, just for our sanity, I'm going to work with curves defined over FP. So not over FQ, but only over a prime field. And that doesn't really, that, that just sort of simplifies a lot of the notation and gets rid of some of the complications. Um, I believe Drew Sutherland's course did a bit of this stuff for elliptic curves in week one, so there's going to be a little bit of overlap, uh, but hopefully not too much, enough to make it helpful, but not too much to make it boring. That's my intention. Okay, so regarding these notes, um, so here's, here's the notes. So they're kind of long, longer than I was expecting. Um, they're too long, right? We're not, we're not going to get through everything of these, almost 60 pages. We're not going to do all of this. Um, but the idea is that, um, you know, we'll do a little overview and then you can take it home and if you're interested, you can spend more time working through the, the theorems and the problems at your own pace. Could, could well take a few months and that, that's fine. Okay, so section one is an introduction and I'll just leave you guys to read that. I'm not going to go through that. Um, section two is um, a sort of summary of results we need from fast arithmetic. So by this I mean stuff like um, multiplying big numbers, multiplying matrices, multiplying polynomials. Um, so what I've tried to do in that section is just collect together all the main statements we need, all the complexity bounds that we need later in the course. So you could skim over it if you want. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about it in these lectures. What I'll do is I'll just occasionally dip into that, into those, into that section, point out the, the results that we need when they come up. I mean, I, I could lecture quite happily for many hours on multiplying big numbers and that sort of thing, but it's, it's not what I was asked to do here. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start at section three today, which is about hyperliptic curves. And I think, I think a lot of you already know this stuff in section three, but I just wanted to sort of have a starting point just to get us all on the same page and, and, and just clarify a few, a few issues that I know are often confusing for graduate students. Um, one more thing I want to say about the notes is um, about the problems. So there's a lot of problems in these notes, I think almost 100. Um, so there's no way you should expect to do all of them, you know, just some of them, whichever one's interesting to you. Um, so there's a few types of problems. So some of them are just, you know, standard testing your knowledge and what's going on. Um, a lot of the problems ask you to give proofs of the various theorems. So I don't actually prove very much in the notes. I just have a problem and I give you a, some hints and some scaffolding and ask you to fill in the proofs. And that's a really important part of the course, is to work through these proofs to understand what's going on. So some of them are just prove some mathematical statement, some trace formula or something, and some of them are um, estimate the complexity of an algorithm, for example. And that's another important part of this whole field of studies, estimating complexities. Um, some of the problems ask you to actually work out an algorithm, like design an algorithm that does something. Um, and some of these are quite easy and some of them are very difficult. I mean, the ones towards the end, you know, could be a research project. It could be, a, you, you could write a paper about one of these problems. Okay, so there's a big range. Um, there's a lot of implementation problems, and I've marked these with a special symbol, the little, uh, the little game controller icon. Now, I'm not a gamer, but my older son plays a lot of Minecraft, too much Minecraft, okay? Um, so um, those problems are specially marked, and um, there's quite a lot of those problems, and I really encourage you to do as many of those as you can. I think it's a really good way to learn these, how these algorithms work. Um, now, this is not a programming course. I'm not going to tell you how to write this code. I, I know a lot of you came here already knowing how to do this, and, and if you didn't, you probably picked up a lot in the last two weeks. Um, so I have a concept in these notes of your uh, favorite computer algebra system. Okay, and you can uh, use whatever system you like. You know, you can write it in Sage or Magma or assembly code, whatever you like, I don't mind. Um, I am completely agnostic about that question. I don't know Magma as well as I should. Maybe I'll, I'll learn some Magma from you guys this week. That'll be great. Um, and finally, there are some unsolved problems in the notes, um, and I've marked those with a little lightning bolt. So, a single lightning bolt means a problem that um, I don't know the answer to. It doesn't necessarily mean it's difficult. It just means when I was writing the notes, like, this problem occurred to me and I thought, oh, I don't quite know how to do that, but that sounds interesting, I'll put it in there. Um, it could just be that someone else knows how to do it and I don't, and that's fine. Um, so have a go at those ones. I'm interested to know if you solve them. There's a handful of problems with two lightning bolts. And okay, now two lightning bolts means that I have tried very hard to solve that problem. Very, very hard, and I still don't know how to solve it. Okay, so if you solve it, let me know. We can write a paper together, okay? All right. So, before I start, are there any questions about the notes or anything I've said so far? All good. All right. Let's get started um, on section three. So I hope these lights come on soon. It's going to be hard to uh, stay awake for everybody. So let's start. So section 3.1. Um, sorry? Can I write darker? <sighs> you, mean, you sort of mean thicker, right? I can try. Let me see. This doesn't seem to get any thicker. How do I... How do I write thicker? There, is that the largest? This shelf? is a big one. Okay, it's the fattest one. There's one that's the... There's one that's even fatter? No, maybe that's as fat as it gets. Yeah, I think yeah, they're the okay. same fatness. Okay, maybe there's okay. a... Maybe there's a trick. Sorry, on its... Yeah, okay, hyperelliptic curves.
you know, <laughs> I deliberately chose this format, right? Because I knew that, you know, with laptops, connectors, plugs, everything, something always goes wrong, right? Nothing ever goes wrong with blackboards. <laughs> okay, hyperelliptic curves. Okay, so we're going to be working over a field K. And um, for our sanity, we're going to assume that the characteristic is not 2. You can do everything in characteristic 2, but let's just not go there. Um, now, for most of the course, K will be a finite field. Okay, but I will also need to worry about the case where K is the rational numbers in section 7. Hopefully we get to section 7. Uh, yeah, I, I, I doubt I'm going to get through all the notes, right? We'll probably get up to section 6 or 7. We'll just see how we go. Um, and I'm going to write uh, G for the genus, which is going to be an integer at least 1. And some of you are probably already worried about G equals 1. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, so what, what do I mean by a hyperelliptic curve? over k of genus g. So I've got a curve c over k. These don't lock, do they? No? Okay. Uh, here's what I'll do. Okay. If I tighten them enough? Yeah, you turn clockwise. Okay. Let's try that. Okay, C over K is going to be smooth algebraic curve associated to, um, is this falling off? No, we're good. Um, associated to an affine equation. I feel like this thing is just falling off me. What's happened here? It has fallen off to the... We go like... That's the mic, alright? Yeah, okay. It's supposed to go like this. I've also never used one of these guys before. Okay. Let's try that. I find equation uh, y squared equals f of x. Now what is f? So f is polynomial over k. And um, I need a few properties. I need it to be square free. And degree either 2g plus 1 or 2g plus 2. Okay, so um, this is what I mean by a hyperelliptic curve um, of genus g over k. So I want to make a few comments about this um, definition. Um, so firstly, let me just, um, just as a matter of notation, let me write f, f0 plus f1x up to f2g plus 2. Okay, so these fj's are in k. Now, I'm always going to write, I'm always going to have the coefficients going up to f2g plus 2, even if the degree is 2g plus 1, it's just much easier that way. So maybe I should say that f 2g plus 2 equals 0 is allowed. Okay, that, that last coefficient can be 0. Um, now I should say something about this g equals 1 case. So usually for genus 1 we don't call this a, a hyperelliptic curve. That's not what it's uh, supposed to be called. Um, so it's supposed to be called an elliptic curve, assuming it has a rational point. Um, but in this course, it doesn't really make a difference, right? Everything I'm going to say works just as well when g equals 1. When g equals 1, you have a, a cubic or a quartic polynomial. 
And so I hope you will forgive me if I just call this a hyperelliptic curve of genus 1. Okay, so for the rest of the course, that's what I mean. Okay, so that's the definition. Woo! Okay. <laughs> Suddenly everything is so much clearer. Everyone wakes up. Fantastic. All right. Now, um, this definition is, is fine. Uh, it, the problem is it's a, it's a little bit abstract, right? I mean, to sort of work out what this means, you need to do a little bit of algebraic geometry, right? For instance, you know, what, 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 what is a smooth algebraic curve associated to this? So there's a few ways you could do it. You could, for example, um, you could embed this in P2 and take the projective closure and then blow up the singular points at infinity. Um, and you'd get some smooth algebraic curve in a, in a higher dimensional space. But that's still not very useful computationally, right? Or you could do something with a function field. You could take the function field and, and look at the you know, places, certain valuations, etc., etc. What I want is a, is a really concrete way of thinking about the points on this curve. Because we want to count the points. So I want to be able to describe the points very concretely and explicitly. So let me show you um, how this works. It's all, it's all very straightforward, except maybe what happens at infinity. I just want to make that uh, very clear. So let's look at the points. So suppose we have a finite extension, L over K. And um, the question is how to describe uh, CL. Okay? Did I call this curve C? Yeah, C is a curve of a K. So I'm interested in um, the L valued points on C, or in other words, the, the points on the curve with coordinates in this extension L. Okay, how can I describe these explicitly? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, so there's a morphism uh, X which goes from the curve to P1. P1 is the projective line, affine line plus a point at infinity. Okay, so here's a picture. Here's the curve, and here's P1, and here's our, here's our, X, our X map. Okay, and this, this morphism induces um, a map on the L-valued points, which I'll, I'll also call X. So it goes from CL to P1L. Okay, this is now just this is now just a map of sets. Um, and P1L, the projective line, this is just uh, L. These are the affine points, or the, the points in, in, in A1, and there's a, a single point at infinity. Okay, so if I want to work out what the points um, on C look like. What I have to do is just take a point in um, in P1, which I'll call I'll call alpha, and work out what are the points that that lie above it here. Okay, so question: Given alpha in P1L, um, what are what are the P's in CL such that X of P is alpha? Okay. Now, there are two cases I want to think about. So first case, very easy. If alpha is in L, right, if alpha is in the, the affine part, then we just solve. We just solve y squared equals f of alpha in L. Okay, so we just we just look we we calculate f of alpha, and then either it's either zero in which case there's going to be one point, or it could be a, a, a non-zero square in L, then we get two points, or it could be a non-square, then we get zero points. Okay, so that's that's fine. And the other case is if alpha is the point at infinity. Well, I can't just plug it into f, right? I can't sort of just plug in f infinity. It, it, it's sort of, it's not in this affine piece. So I need to switch to a different model. Uh, 
okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a change of coordinate on the P1. So let me write, um, let me write u equals one over x, right? So x was my parameter on P1. So the only problem is when x is infinity. So when x is infinity, I get u equals zero. So I just need to work out the equation for my curve um, in these new coordinates. So maybe I'll do that over here. Um, so let's, let's write out the equation. So y squared is uh, f0 plus f1x plus f2g plus 2, x to the 2g plus 2. Now if I plug in x equals 1 over u, I'm going to get a bunch of denominators here. I'll get some negative powers of u, and if I, I clear the denominators, and then I'll get some power of u over here, and I have to absorb that into the y. So let's introduce a variable v, which is going to be y over x to the g plus 1. And if I plug these into this equation and see what I get, I get this equation. v squared equals f0 u to the 2g plus 2 plus f1 u to the 2g plus 1 all the way up to f 2g plus 2. And you can see what I get is I get another equation in the same form with the coefficients just reversed. Okay? And now you can sort of see why I wanted to keep this, this f 2g plus 2 even if the degree was 2g plus 1. It's because of this, so there's some parity stuff going on. Um, and if, if this happens to be zero, then of course I just get a zero constant term in this polynomial in u. Okay, that's fine. Um, so now, since um, I was interested in x equals infinity, that means I'm now interested in u equals zero, right? So x is infinity corresponds to u equals zero. So to find the points in this case, I just have to solve uh, v squared equals, well I plug in u equals zero and I get f 2g plus 2. That's what I have to solve. And this is telling me how many points at infinity there are. Again, they're either zero, one, or two, depending on whether um, f 2g plus 2 is, is zero or square or a, or a non-square in L. Okay, so it's going to be, uh, what I'll do is I'll define f infinity f infinity is going to be this, this, uh, this highest degree term, f2g plus 2. Okay, so let me, let me summarize what I've done so far. Um, so this is actually lemma um, 3.16, I think, in the notes. 